My presentation, very briefly talk about uh, what or who uh, Veritas is. Um, this is what you guys are interested in, this is what John asked me to speak about. It's some of the uh, uh, trials, the research, and the results that we've been getting for uh, Ontario. Um, we'll talk about, and you've seen it in the, in the beginning of the presentation, um, I like to talk about economics as well as agronomics. So I am an agronomist, C uh, certified uh, crop advisor, professional agrologist, went to the University of Guelph. I love looking at soil tests. If you ever want to shut me up, show me a soil test and all of a sudden I'll be nice and quiet. So, uh, But uh, yeah, we'll talk about the economics behind a lot of this. We'll talk about uh, some of the work that we've been uh, involved with on the R2 stage of soybeans and how it ties into working with fungicides. Um, talk about how collecting data. How many people have yield, uh, yield monitors on their combines that are collecting yield data for maps? All right, so not a huge uh, piece. Maybe your equipment dealers are really promoting it. I'll uh, show, you, show you some uh, economic reasons why you may want to be thinking about doing that. How many people are collecting data with their plant monitors and diligently putting, putting in the correct varieties every time? <laughs> I will say, attempt to demonstrate the value behind that. Um, we'll get heavily into uh, variable rate planting. Uh, this is something we've been involved with at uh, Veritas since 2010. So on corn, soybeans, <coughs> and uh, dry beans this past year. And I will share the uh, results with it, the economics behind it. Um, let you see why. I'm kind of a white individual, so try to stick by me and stuff that work. Um, this is a new, uh, new concept that we've uh, finally got perfected. Uh, we call it geospatial nutrient tracking. So I'll share with you. Um, this is something that uh, would, might uh, add value to uh, going down the path of using yield monitors to be able to uh, tie that in as well. And then finally, I've got one miscellaneous trial that I'll throw in that is uh, kind of interesting that John thought would, uh, you guys might find interesting. So real quick, Veritas. For those of you who are not Latin majors or did not take it in uh, um, high school, Veritas is Latin for truth. So if you think of the word verify, that is where uh, Veritas comes from. It's on a lot of coat of arms if you're looking around, so um, you'll see the word Veritas. Uh, it uh, refers to truth. We've been around for five years. We are owned by a, uh, um, a traditional ag retailer that sells seed, fertilizer, chemicals. Back in 2009, they spun us off on our own and said, okay, you guys do the value added stuff, go to it, don't ask us for money, just here's your seed money, uh, go and try and make more money doing what you guys do best. So uh, we now have two offices, Chatham, I live in Chatham. Our second office is in Park Hill and that's actually where I grew up. I grew up in uh, Park Hill. So I do a, tra a lot of traveling back and forth. We focus on uh, the research, education. Uh, a, lot, a big part of our business is now getting into uh, business coaching, the agronomy, and uh, precision egg, which are two of my areas that I enjoy. Key behind Veritas is how we think. We think differently because we are not selling inputs. We are not selling seed, chemicals, fertilizer. We don't care where you uh, sell your grain to. What we are interested in is innovating unique solutions. We always want to try weird uh, things. Um, to see how we can push uh, the envelope further forward. That said, we work with a lot, of, a lot of large farmers. These guys want whatever we come up with to make it easy. And I'm sure you guys want your life to be easier. You do not need my help and you do not need to pay me to make your life more difficult. You got lots of ways to make your own life uh, difficult. You don't need to do this. So anything we do, we look for ways to make it easier for people. And then the key part for me, um, my father immigrated from Holland in 1974, so I have uh, um, uh, almost pretty close to purebred uh, Dutch heritage, so every so often I go back to the old country and they retrain me that it's important to make sure that you're making money. <laughs> <laughs> so, first one, automatic row shutoffs. Anybody have this on their equipment? This is the stuff that your, your neighbors are really impressed. But wow, that, that looks great. Anybody have this added equipment? Okay. How many people who don't have it have heard of it and their equipment dealers are saying, you need a new plant for yours. Your neighbors are really, really going to be impressed if you can plant like this. So, 
overlap. Um, things that increase the amount of overlap. Obviously, the big thing with overlap is you are spending more on seed, right? And that seed and, and or fertilizer isn't truly of a value. So some of the things that are going to affect it is field shape, right? My father, farmer, I don't think he owns a square farm to his name. So he has a lot of uh, overlap. Size of plant. Now, he's fairly small. He runs a uh, 15 uh, foot uh, wide white planter dean. So I, I definitely uh, hear you on the, the white planters. Um, but I also work with some large herbs. I work with 90 foot white planters. A lot of overlap in those cases. My father has a very long planter, so he can't see all the way to the back, hence he has a little bit more overlap. Speed of the planting, right? Plant faster, you're going to have more overlap. The risk of rain. I have seen uh, on the research when I pulled the, the numbers, and you can see where the uh, um, tractor sped up. We can go back and check to see what time of day that was. It's almost always right after lunch when the uh, noon weather report comes on that there's rain coming. All of a sudden you go up uh, um, half to a mile per hour. <laughs> you guys laugh because you know it's true. And planting progress for a state. How many people were planting corn on June 2nd last year at five miles an hour? It's hammer down, we gotta get this in. And farmer patients. Some growers are just more patient than others. Here's the question. On corn, does 60,000 nuts, so this is where the overlap happens, does it equal 30,000 cups? There's the picture. We actually have test plots where we force the overlap. So we go back and forth. Neighbors think we're nuts when we're going back and forth across uh, the rows, but we're actually setting it up so we can measure when we, where we have 60,000 nubbins, and not just push the population, but actually so that they're crossing over just like you'd have in a headland, does 60,000 nubbins equal 30,000 cups? What do you guys think? If you look at that, would you see it's about the same? Here's the results going back all the way to 2011. Um, has different row spacings, some 20 inches, some 30 inches. The blue bar is the corn. $100 per acre in seed savings. So this is seed savings plus yield. So we had a couple of results where your um, all the savings that uh, you're getting is from seed. However, you look at all these other bars, that's where you're actually having yield loss. 60,000 nubbins does not equal 30,000 cobs. This is, we do this using a hand shell. So we are assuming you're going to get every single cob. Wherever you guys uh, harvested the uh, overlap corn, if it is standing, because that's also where it's going to go down, not every cob's going to go through uh, into your combine, right? You've got those small little nubbins that's going to go right through the stripper plates. We assume that you're going to get every one. So this is kind of a best case scenario. On average, over multiple years, we're over $200 an acre wherever you have overlap. Now you're going to tell me, well, I don't have much overlap. On a square field, long-term average, of the data we've seen, when you combine all the different planters, you're looking on at between two to three percent on a perfectly square field. You start getting to the fields like my dad's got, with a nice long planter or super wide planter, that number starts jumping. All of a sudden you're at 11, 12, 13 percent overlap. That's assuming that you don't mind harvesting the down corn where it's all overlapped in the fall, and maybe with a little bit of snow around too. Starting last year, we started to do this on soybeans. You think hand harvesting corn is a lot of work? Hand harvesting soybeans is a horrible job. Wouldn't recommend it to anyone, um, but it's about $100 a day. So not as big, but it's definitely there. So importance of R2 in soybeans. Does everyone know what I'm talking about R2 on soybeans? There's been a lot of talk about this in the newspaper around uh, fungicides. Dr. Humphrey's been doing a pile of work on it, right? So when you're talking about stages of soybeans, R1 is as soon as you see a flower on your uh, soybeans. R2 is as soon as you have a flower in one of the top two nodes of your soybeans. So when fungicides first were being used on uh, soybeans, we were talking about R3 soybean, R3 uh, spray. Now there's a lot of talk about going early. And I'm going to tell you the story behind why people are going early. Question for you guys. This is a little interactive. It gets a little quiet. 
what part of the soybean plant is the majority of your yield coming from? What do you guys think? Is it the top little bit of the last few pods? Is it the very bottom of the plant? Is it the middle? Traditionally, what do farmers think? It's the top little, last little cluster of soybeans. That's what I've heard. I've got a few guys that will argue that point. But my thoughts were always that soybeans are an August crop. We need those rains in August to get the nice big soybean crop. That, What's that? You need seed size from the rain. You need the seed size. That's a good point. I, I, I've got a slide about that. How many soybean plants would it take me of showing, if I just pulled out one soybean plant and see, all the beans are at the top, or all the pods are at the bottom. How many would it take for you guys to think, maybe your thinking is uh, maybe a little different? 10 plants? 100 plants? 10? Yeah. If you've seen 10 plants, you'd be like, all right. Maybe that makes sense for that field, that variety. Maybe I have to change it up for uh, depending on how many years. So, starting 2010, my dad wanted to go back to Holland. He wanted to go back first of August. He had some high value IP beans. He uh, doesn't want to lose them for quality. So he's going to go out there and spray a fungicide. Dad, you have to wait until August to spray the fungicide. Nope, that's when the plane leaves. You're going to go spray at the end of uh, July. Fine, Dad, do whatever you want. You don't listen to me anyway. Goes out and sprays them. We added a foliar fertilizer to it. And of course, like a great farmer, he does not leave a check strip for me to test because that year we had 58 bushel high value IP soybeans. Those things normally grow, go 35. The uh, grain elevator thought we were salting the load and they actually paid to have the samples sent away for DNA marking to make sure we were not salting the load. So we're sitting there going, wow, what did we do different? So in 2011, I started to play around with this idea and the tech strips. And we got about two and a half bushel response, except two guys. Now, what happened was different was I looked at my dad's results and I said, okay, if this works for um, spring in July by adding a full year, what would happen if I put them in August? Because let's face it, August is, uh, is when soybeans are made. So that's what I uh, did, except two guys. One of them, I gave the product to the young lad. I said, tell your dad not to spray this until the first week of uh, um, August. His dad had been around for a while, seen all kinds of jungle juices. Said, you know what, I just need to get this job out of the way. I'll go and spray it on the 22nd of July. The other guy, he didn't plant his beans until the 1st of uh, um, July because he was tiling. So in that case, all of a sudden those beans were at a later stage. So we had two and a half bushel response on eight out of the 10 plots. Those other two, replicated plots, eight bushels and nine bushel response. Huh, something's weird going on here. So I started collecting soybean plants and counting how many pods were at each node. So in 2011, I counted the number of pods on 535 plants. My bosses, my coworkers, everyone, my cooperators all thought it was nuts, so I had to do it at home at my kitchen table. I'm not married, so that's why I have time to do this type of stuff. I got an interesting curve. I said, there's no way that could be right. So in 2012, I replicated it. And now I expanded my geographical area. So I wanted to make sure that this was actually making sense. And I did it on 4,375 times. I mentioned the not married part, right? So I really wish I'd taken a picture of, of uh, my kitchen that, that year because uh, it, it was kind of interesting to look at. Here's the curve. So beans at the very top of the plant. Yep, there's a yield bump there. There's a few more pods there, definitely. Look how close those two lines follow each other. Two very different years. Here's that R2 stage. This is where you get the majority of your beans. The, those nodes number, I'm gonna say number three to number five, maybe six, depending on how tall of a plant you get. That's where you are going to see three, four, five pods per node. That's where you get your yield from. So we were playing around with the idea of getting um, what I was hoping was larger beans. So, but what we found out, we were actually getting more beans. And the reason why is if you think about it, if you have one extra bean, not an extra pot, just one bean, 
If you have 165,000 plants, which is an average uh, population for the area I was working in, and you divide it by 2,750 seeds per pound, you get one, uh, one bushel, 60 pounds. So for one extra bean per plant, you get one extra bushel. What happens if you get an extra pot or two? We often hear that soybeans will abort 75 to 90 percent of their pot, uh, of their flowers. Soybeans have huge yield potential, right? We've heard about Kip Peelers at 162. You look at the theoretical uh, soybean yield, it approaches that of corn. Problem is, soybeans do their own thing. Looks like maybe this fungicide thing has something going for it because what we're doing is we're saving a couple of those flowers. We're not saving all of them, but we are saving a couple. Another thing about R2 and soybeans, um, it's about temperature. If you uh, have a temperature that uh, drops below 10 degrees, it starts to affect the pollen in the soybean flower. If that happens, it cannot pollinate. So there goes some of your flowers that you're aborting because soybeans are, for the most part, are self-pollinating. So I work in the, I live in Chatham, Kent, so I grabbed the weather from that. Just outside of Dresden, on the 25th of July, we got down to 7.9 degrees. I'm not a uh, meteorologist, but I am willing to guarantee if we were at 7.9 in Chatham, you guys were even colder. Now we grow a uh, group two, group three uh, soybean, a group uh, zero, group one bed bean that you guys are probably growing. It's gonna be a little bit more tolerant to that temperature under 10 degrees, but you are still affecting that yield. So when this happened, all through August, I was talking to uh, bean traders and I was saying, hey guys, you better be uh, ready for a low soybean yield. However, what happened was the majority of the soybean growing area in Ontario did get lots and lots of rain in August. So the bean size is huge. I have a seed grower I work with, told me, uh, did not yesterday, the day before, that uh, the seed company has rejected his uh, seed beans because they're too big. They cannot get 140,000 uh, beans into one bag. So this year, beans are big. So this is some uh, cool stuff that you get into uh, uh, with your uh, monitors. If you calculate or plug everything in correctly into your planting monitor, you can then take what's called variety tracking and you can plug it into your combine and you can see right away as you're going up and down the field, when you are in that variety, what is your yield and it tracks it and it puts it in separate loads for you so you're able to scroll back and uh, check it. Great thing about this is when you are about 25% through your corn crop, and you've got three seed dealers hanging off the ladder of your combine, all wanting you to place an order, you can scroll back and go, uh, yeah, no, I'm not gonna order any of yours. And you can show them the data from your farm right away. Now, if you don't agree with uh, uh, variety tracking by a split planter uh, um, combination, and you wanna put larger strips or blocks, whatever the uh, case may be, um, you can actually program it. It's called variety tracking. So this is an example, two different varieties side by side across the whole field. That's the yield, um, moisture, so this is around Park Hill, we had uh, obviously a little bit of issues on that uh, case, and the number of acres involved. So this is test pots from your farm. I sold seed for 10 years. Whenever I'd go to a grower and show him two test pots, he would say, do you have any more? And every time I would go and show him 25, he'd say, do you have more, right? <laughs> this is actually the numbers on your field. <laughs> this is a population uh, concept. Um, so different populations, that's his planting map. This is his uh, actual results at 32,000, 34,000, 36,000. You can see what's happening with the yield and the number of acres involved. So once again, instantaneous uh, to tell you what's happening. Uh, this is actually a speed trial. A lot of interest around speed. This is only a single trial. I'm not suggesting for a second that you go plant everything at six miles an hour, but in this particular case, um, it uh, would look like it's uh, definitely helping them out. So these are some of the things that you can start doing with your monitor. Variable rate planting. This is something that I enjoy talking about. This is our map of all the sites that we did a variable rate prescription for. Green is not John Deere. Green is corn. Pink is uh, soybeans. And then the couple blue ones are dry beans. We started doing corn in 2010, and in 2013 we started with soybeans, um, and then this past year was our first year with edibles. 
So very quickly, to develop a variable rate prescription, when we sit down with the grower, I do not believe, and I will probably be proven one, wrong one day, that you cannot get a computer to generate a prescription all on its own. You have to have that human interaction. I know a lot of very smart computer programmers. I would, I don't, I, I think they're very good at programming computers. I'm not convinced that they're good at growing a crop. So trying to create a, a system all by automated, I'm not sold on it. Maybe one day we'll get there. This is some of the stuff that we talk about with our growers when we're trying to develop the prescription, uh, location, history, what variety, some varieties respond differently than others, uh, what size of equipment, we'll explain why we do that, um, any relevant yield data. We do use satellite and aerial imagery that, you, uh, that uh, growers have or that we're able to access. We've got a fairly extensive library. However, I've got some growers that have drone imagery. That said, the most important layer is the layer of data between your ears. You know your fields better than I will, than your yield monitor, than a drone, than uh, someone in St. Louis or California writing a variable rate prescription, then you will know that better than any of those sources. Your information going into that prescription is absolutely critically important. Now we take all of this stuff and we create a bit of management zone map. And I'll talk about a management zone map in about two seconds. Basically what we do is put different rates into different management zones, and then do you agree with this? We load it into your uh, monitor, and then once again, to make it easy. So this management zone, this is kind of a buzzword in the industry. What exactly is a management zone? So if you think about it, if you had a very sandy farm and extremely heavy farm, would you farm them differently? Maybe a different variety, maybe different fertilizer. Sandy farm, you might need to use one. You agree that you're going to have to farm them differently? Most guys would say yes. So, what management zones are is splitting your field into different parts. My dad didn't have uh, very good imagery or very good yield data on one of his fields, so he drew a line last year. I said, okay, that uh, side of the farm we're going to plant at 140,000, this side at 170,000. He created two management zones. Very great planting, the way he went. Um, so, management zones, different parts of your field, like different fields, like, uh, they would be different fields. Question is, do you need satellite and drone imagery? There's piles and piles of ways to create management zones. Like I said, it's as simple as drawing a line and saying one's one, way, one rate and one's the other rate. It can get more complicated with yield data, with satellite imagery. Um, there's some pretty cool stuff coming out of Purdue on uh, t topography. That, okay, this is where the high point of my field, this is the low point. Um, over the last 100 years, the soil's probably eroded down that way when I use uh, weather. It's pretty cool stuff. However, there's easy ways to make management zones and complicated ones. Here's a field just outside of uh, Forest. This is the field that we're writing a prescription for. So you guys can see this is... Uh, aerial imagery. I think you guys can see that there's pretty distinct differences in this uh, farm. Um, the white areas are a harder, higher eroded knolls than the, uh, the nice low areas. There's the yield map. When guys talk about creating management zones with drones or with satellite imagery, they'll tell you, you know what? Our system, it correlates really, really strongly to a yield map. If it correlates really strongly to a yield map, why would you spend the money to have a drone done on it outside of Dean? I think it would be really cool going for one of those parachute rides, even though I'm terrified of heights and gravity's not my friend. But uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. That said, if you're going to pay someone to do it, and their solution is that, well, it's pretty close to your yield map, use your yield map. This is variable rate planting. In corn, the better soil, the more productive soil, we put a higher rate, less productive, lower rate. Outside of, you don't want to go too low because you may have emergence issues. Soybeans and dry beans, we reverse it. So the mean old uh, gnarly knoll, that the beans have a hard time coming up, let's put a pile more beans. Or if it's a sandy ridge and the beans are only going to come part way up to your knee, let's put lots of them there. Like I said, all you need is one extra bean to get an extra bushel. If you have one extra pod, 
and the average pot is about 2.3 uh, beans. Um, I know everybody thinks it's three, but it's actually 2.3. Uh, trust me, I counted 5,000 plants. <laughs> That's where it is. Um, and so if you have an extra plant, you just start adding more uh, to, to the bottom line. One of the problems we ran into, guys got frustrated with the prescriptions because they would not show up with enough seed or not enough seed. So now we actually program it and it tells you exactly what your average is and exactly how many bags you need. So that way you're not having to do any extra work than that necessary. This is the uh, zone map that I showed you. This is the yield map that comes back after. Would you guys agree that there's pretty strong correlation? That means this one kind of looks like that. Okay. So, what we have proven is that your best yield is going to come from your best soil. Think about that one for a second. Best yield from best soil. And you need to pay me to do that for you? You need to change populations to do that? That's the problem with very berate. Everybody talks about this. Best yield from best soil. I remember when I was 12 years old at the uh, combine uh, um, days with my dad and uh, um, they were introducing the yield monitors and the guy stood up there and said, yeah, now the combine's going to tell you where the, the yield's good, right? All the guys in the audience looked at him and said, we already know where the yield's good. Why, why do we need your equipment? So this is some of the stuff that we get off Twitter. Exact same thing. Population goes up because you're into better soil. Yield goes up until you get to a certain point. Once again, that's not proving that variable rates are actually making you more money. You have to come up with a way to measure. So, how do you guys measure? You do test strips, right? You turn the script on and off. This is what we started with in 2010, right? Farmer turning it on and off. I'm riding along in the uh, combine, yakking away like I always talk. He forgets to turn the back on the prescription. We get an extra wide test spot. I call it an extra wide test spot. He calls it, well, we agreed to uh, uh, meet in the middle and call it Noopsy. Okay, so remembering to turn it back on and off. So in 2011, we pre-programmed the strips. I asked them, okay, how wide is your planter? What side of the planter you, or field are you going to start uh, working on? I can calculate it over. Pre-program a strip in there for him. So as he's planting, it automatically puts a check strip in there. Okay, pretty cool. 2011, we had about $110, $115 net return by comparing that strip to the strip right beside it. Hey, this is amazing, this is great. Problem was in 2012, when we compared, for example, this strip to the one beside it, we were losing $70 per acre. That didn't look so good, so we started digging into the data and under, trying to understand what actually happened. And what it comes down to is it depends on where you put your uh, tester. Dean, you were talking about digging up that uh, row where it had no compaction, it's really loose and you went over a couple rows where there was some compaction, right, and it, it was still nice but still plated. I imagine if you were to hand harvest one one thousandth of each row, there would be a yield difference, would there? You expect? I've never done individual rows. Okay, but it, it would make logical sense that it's going to, to change. So the challenge behind this is it depends on where you put your check strip. If you put your check strip in a strategic spot, you will win every time with variable rate. If you put it in the wrong spot, you're gambling with Mother Nature. So, and that's what we were seeing. But when we actually started analyzing down at the lower level, we found we were actually not losing $70 per acre, but when we split out the different zones, if we changed uh, just a few things, we were back up to about uh, plus $10. So the challenge becomes is how do you find a truly representative strip? So in 2013, we came up with this idea we call it Veriblox. Basically, it's a grid pre-programmed, um, and in the different zones, we put different blocks scattered around. And then we compare that block to the one beside it, put it into a monster spreadsheet, and it kicks out a result. But it does take a lot of work to analyze it. So my co co-workers, my colleagues, told me that they had had enough of that and I had to come up with an easier way. So in 2014, we came up with this idea of a Veragrid. It looks exactly the same, because it basically is. All it is is a little bit changing on the software side, on analyzing, it makes it a lot easier. Now the strips are, now the blocks are pre-programmed like we always wanted. 
They're representative. You can put all kinds of them. It's not a case that you just have one block because now we can actually have blocks uh, going across uh, multiple zones. We get lots of reps and reps, right? So we can give you lots of uh, plots. It's easy to analyze. We put them into every one of our scripts. So you go back to that map. Every one of them had it. And we can include outlier rates. Right? Instead of planting a full zone at 40,000 and a third of your field at 40,000 and a third of your field going flat and having a very grumpy farmer, now you put one of these blocks in there at 40,000. Those blocks are 120 feet by 120 feet in most cases. We can modify them depending on the case. But 120 feet by 120 feet is a third of an acre. Once again, it basically kicks out a big table like this. We plug it into a spreadsheet. It gives us a net return on a dollar's per acre. We base the, the dollars per acre on uh, what we call triple net. After the difference in seed, after the difference in yield, and after you pay your prescription, what is the amount of money left in your pocket? 2013 corn, there's the results. So we actually get two numbers. We get what did you actually get, and we also get if you had gone up or down a little bit more on the seed rate, what could have you potentially got? So the blue is the actual, the red is the uh, theoretical. So what you end up with is even in these cases where you're losing money, when you start analyzing the data, you start finding other opportunities. So in uh, 2013, like I said, we started this in 2010, uh, we were triple net plus just shy of $17. In 2013, like I said, we started on soybeans. We started on soybeans. So at this point, we had four years practice on corn. This was our gamble on soybeans. We didn't really know what we were doing. Just, hey, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Plus $18. We were already ahead of our corn. Just blind, uh, blind luck, we were thinking. Beans are worth more. 4.1 bushel increase. That's, that's impressive. So 2014, um, these are the results that I've been using. Same thing. You got some, some negatives uh, down there. Um, after everything's done, we've actually gone up a little bit in yield because we, we can analyze a little bit better. Um, and a little bit higher in uh, dollars per acre, not much. I will tell you, it's rare, if not impossible, to get over 38000 to pay. I'm sure a seed company somewhere will find a variety, and maybe there's some out on the market, that can handle thir over 38000 in certain uh, uh, field conditions. No doubt in my mind. They have a vested interest in selling you more seed. Right? They make more money on that. As of today, when you go into that, what ends up happening is the yield to response curves are not one of these nice, gentle curves. I'll tell you, it goes up to a certain point and then drops off. So you end up costing yourself significant yield in your best soil. This is the soybean uh, results uh, today. We're at $27 our second year into it. We've got limited dry bean uh, data. On average, dry beans are $50 per acre net return. Soybean, very great soybeans, very great dry beans. Those ones have me yet into it. Very, very corn, everybody's uh, working on it. I personally think it would be one way to get into uh, multi-hybrid corn, that will see a big, uh, big bump. That said, someone's gonna give me $15 per acre on my corn as a net return um, per acre, and I've got 500 acres of corn. I'll take their $7,500. I'm willing to go along with that deal, especially because the same equipment is used for my overlap, and so I'm going to be able to make some money there too. On uh, uh, soybeans, white mold has been a problem. You guys had some white mold up here, I uh, understand. Had it everywhere, it seemed. That said, white mold, it, I would not necessarily change my plans based on one year of white mold. I went back and looked to see when the last time we had a really bad white mold uh, was, and I think it was 1990. It's either 89 or 90. I'm not 100% positive. I remember the disaster in my dad's fields, because the, and that's why I think it was 90, because in 91 we went no-till on everything to try to keep the amount of white mold down. That said, we actually have a trial on a trial site in near Forest. Um, this is some of the meanest, nastiest clay that you can imagine. And the reason why was we had some of the nicest dirt at one point for our trials. And we'd take the farmers out, they look at it and they go, ooh, that's nice dirt. That's kind of a cool uh, trial. That ain't my dirt. Won't work on my farm. So now we've got the meanest, nastiest uh, clay that we can find. So when farmers look at it, they walk out and they go, ooh, made it work on this. 
yeah, maybe I'll try this on my farm. So we uh, planted our soybeans 15 inch rows with the unit planter, it's three replications. We used a very, very bushy type plant, a uh, variety that turned out to be absolutely uh, polluted with white mold this year. Um, here's the yields, 165,000, 49.65, 185, 51.79, 205, 50, anyone seen the trend? What's going on? 225, still going up, but just barely. You're probably not paying for your seed. And your variable rate, it's a little bit less. Variable rate did not win the coffee shop rules, which I understand is the rules of uh, the high yield pump. Where, the, where I made my mistake was in the variable rate, I should have had a 250. Then we would have seen a uh, variable rate do better. This is me nasty claim. I just did not push the population high enough. Geospatial nutrient track. All right, these are uh, OMAFRA um, industry accepted numbers for nutrient removals. Um, no doubt uh, about it, uh, Dean, you were uh, mentioning uh, point two. There's lots of uh, phosphate and potash, it's just tied up in the soil. So, the, But this is what the crop, what the researchers tell me the uh, crop actually removes. So, if it removes 0.4 pounds of uh, P205, which is phosphate, 200 pounds of, uh, uh, or 200 bushels is gonna be 80 pounds, right? For easy math, let's pretend math is 50%. Uh, so that's 160 pounds of math. In your parts of your field where you're only getting 150 bushels per acre, it uh, works out to 120 pounds of math. So if you had an evenly split field 50-50 with these two zones, you would say, okay, I need 175 bushels per acre. 175 bushels per acre is 140 pounds max. What have you just done? Well, in your best parts of your soil, you've robbed 20 pounds. In your toughest part of your soil, you've put 20 pounds extra. I worked in the fertilizer industry. I know how tough it is to set a pull type spreader just right so that you run out uh, just uh, shot. However, whenever you run out, or whenever you finish the field and you got half a ton left in the spreader, where do you go and spread it? You go and spread it on the tougher parts. You already have extra fertilizer there. When I go out and I soil test, it's not uncommon for me to see my highest soil tests on my least productive soils. Now that said, I'm not saying you have to go out and throw a whack load of uh, phosphate in your most productive soils. I do believe this approach combined with soil testing will give you a better idea as to what you should be doing. Um, and then we talked about runoff and erosion. It's actually in the, in the higher uh, eroded areas where you're going to see more erosion. You have more phosphate there to begin with. So we actually generate a map like this. It looks a lot like a yield map, but it generates a number and it tells you what was your average phosphate and potash removed. You don't have to go in and do variable rate application, but what uh, we're able to do is now layer, this is actually a two year uh, map, we can layer it every, say, five years, and we can look at it and go, you know what, yeah, we need to soil test here, probably should soil test here, maybe a couple up here, over this corner, and we can see where our levels are, and now you can go in and uh, um, customize your fertilizer requirements. Miscellaneous trials. Okay, actually I had two miscellaneous trials, I forgot about this one. Headland compaction. There is significant yield loss on headlands. Uh, I've seen this all with my dad's uh, corn planter. Uh, so I had this great idea where I would test how much uh, um, head the loss was uh, happening from headlands, and then I was going to charge my father to write a, uh, um, a file to his monitor so that way it would turn off the corn planter when he got to the end of the field and he could plant his headlands last. Right? Oh, this is pretty ingenious. So, when we planted the headlands first, we lost 18 bushels per acre when it once again hand harvested. So, what we did was we, before we planted our plot, we went back and forth across on an angle with a nice heavy planter, a nice compacted area. Planted right into it. And then, after we were finished planting our plot, we took another chunk of the plot and we drove it back and forth and again, just like if uh, you were uh, um, planting into a Headland or a headland that you had been turning around all, on all day. So this is this this is going to make Veritas huge money. So when we planted the headlands last, 
<laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Not all of our ideas work. Some of them work, some of them we, uh, we need to refine just a touch. We did the same thing on soybeans. Soybeans, I call it a bushel, and yeah, I wouldn't get too excited about this just yet. But something, it's something pretty cool. I actually got this idea from a farmer to try this out. So some pretty interesting stuff. Final one is closing wheel trucks. Uh, see these things marketed, these curvetine spike closing wheels, stuff like that. So we did this trial with a grower and he is a poultry farmer. He's very, very uh, conscientious about his soil structure. Lots of cover crops, strip tilling. Okay, strip tilling, not strip cropping. Um, so very, very conscientious uh, around his field. Um, the thinking has always been with these is that you get a slightly better emergence. There was no difference in emergence. There's exactly the same number of cobs on each side. Okay? So we thought, he, because when he brought this idea to me that he wasn't wanting to try this out on this planter, I told him, I said, George, it doesn't make any sense. George's must just be a little wired differently. Uh, that, that name must do something to them. But uh, we tested it out. I didn't think anything was going to happen. Something did happen. First time we did it, we seen a big, uh, about a 10 bushel yield of the increase. So I went back out there, exact same thing, tried it again, another 10 bushels. Went out there, tried a couple other spots, not as good, but every time, wherever the curvetine closing wheel was, and it wasn't two of them, it was just a single one on one side, and we matched it up with uh, where there was no compaction from the uh, tractor, so it was the two middle rows, I can't explain it, but there is something going on here with those Kermantine wheels that just seem to make things a little, uh, a little bit more uh, easier for the roots to get going. And I'd love to talk to Dean about it, and maybe he's got some insight that maybe it's just that little bit of compaction that's limiting uh, on root growth and, and phosphate. I'm not sure. I thought it was a pretty cool uh, experiment. So that's basically all I've got. I'm welcome, you're welcome to contact me at any point, email, Twitter, give me a call if you got questions. I'll be here to answer any other questions for a little bit. Or if you guys have questions now, you want to fire up.